Okay, so I've just started the machine up. Waiting for it to come up. And yep, there's the grub menu. Let's try and boot. Uh, right, okay. So I'm not sure what's happened there. Let's try LFS4. Well, that seems to be all right. Um, so let's try. FS1. I've just also realised that the DOS option is not there either for some reason. Needs to sync up. It needs to sync up every now and then uh, manually. So let's try LFS1. That's obviously working okay. That's booting. So that's fine. Let's try SUS. I assume that's going to work. Uh, things one and four have worked. Yep, that's working fine. Okay, so I need to find out why it can't execute. Oh, I've just thought of something actually. Um, I don't remember when I showed the files, the kernels in boot. I commented on the fact that I was surprised that the um, kernel size for the newer kernel was half the size of the older kernel, which is very strange. I would expect it to be at least the same size, if if not bigger, being it's a newer version of the kernel. Um, despite the fact that it's only a few minor versions on from the previous version, from the Linux Scratch 4 version. So I'm wondering if I've copied the wrong file. Um, so it's got the wrong, it's got the right name, but it's the wrong contents of the file. I bet that's what the problem is. So what I'll do is boot into Linux Scratch 4 and fix it from there and also see if we can see why the uh, DOS option is not there unless Grub's intelligent enough that he can't see anything to boot on that partition that that is a possibility um, unlikely but still a possibility Right, so let's scratch four. And login as root, mount, boot, and yep. Yeah, there it is at the bottom. It's um, can I show you? Yeah. You can see it's way. That's about a megabyte, and this is about half a megabyte in size. So it's way too small. So what I'll do is mount dev. In fact, we should have LFS set, shouldn't we? Yeah, mount dev hda8 into LFS cd LFS sources. Linux Arch um, i386 boot uh, BZ image. Yeah, I don't know what I've copied, but that's the that's what should be there. That there. 
So I don't know what I've copied that's half a meg. Um, let me see what I, what I would have copied and pasted from the book on another terminal. Uh, Arch i386 boot bz image. Yeah, I've copied, well, I don't know what I copied actually, but um, that does point to exactly the same path and file name was the one I would have expected. So I'll have to look back on the video to see what I've done wrong there. So, um, right, what I need to do here then is to copy BZ image CP, I'll do minus V to make sure I can see it being copied to boot and VM Linux dash 2.4.22 LFS 5.0. So as I mentioned previously, with Lilo, you'd have to remember to rerun Lilo so that the boot sector, uh, the, sorry, the disk sectors of that file would be updated correctly in the Lilo table. But with Grub, that's all we need to do is just come out of the directory, um, unmount LFS and reboot, and we can log off first reboot and we can now test that and hopefully that will work Right, so I'll press enter, and yes, it's working this time because it's got the correct file there, something it can actually execute. And that looks like that's booting okay. Yep, that's worked five, and even the um, host name has come up correctly now. It hasn't got a full stop in the name, so that's good as well. There's been no errors with the scripts that have run. The kernel seems to have run correctly. I can log in successfully. Um, let's ping my server, got access to that. Let's try pinging the Linux from scratch website. In fact, I can't remember if they allow pings or not. I don't think they do. Yes, they do. Okay. Uh, no, they don't. It's responded. The DNS has worked, but it looks like they don't allow that. So let's try, um, kernel.org and yeah that one's responding so that's okay so it proves that we've got network i've got network network connectivity within my network and outside the big wide world um let's try links let's see if i can uh, yep there it is go to my server yep that's no problem that's all working fine. Um, what else is there to test? Let, yeah, let's try the links again with yeah a website. Yeah, I think that's the SSL encryption is probably not up to standard, um, and that's why that's not working. Uh, let's try getting into okay that's good so I can SSH into the uh, my server. Now what I'm going to do is try and SSH back and as I don't think this will work because of the um, SSL encryption 
not being allowed. Yeah, you see it says that I can't do it there. But I can get around this with a fix because this won't work on the most recent um, SSH. Uh, if I do SSH version, is it? Or is it V? It might be a capital V. Yeah, you can see it's SSH 8. The latest versions of OpenSSH 9 won't allow this, but on, on um, that new version. But this version 8, although it won't allow um, this really old version of OpenSSH, which is, let's look to see what version it is. I think it's version 2, as I remember. Uh, version 3.7. So what, although it won't allow that version to log in, we can fix this by editing or creating um, a file in the .ssh directory, the hidden directory for the, for the user called config and I have to type quite a lot here but um, so what we're saying here, remember I'm on the remote uh, which one is it? Is this right? Yes, I'm on the remote server here because I want to come back into the Pentium 233. So I've connected from the Pentium 233 into my remote server. And now I'm trying to configure the remote server to come back into this machine. So I need to tell it that this IP address, I want it configured with these settings. SH A1. So let me just check that because there's some debounce problems with this keyboard. So Kex algorithms. There should be a space. Plus Diffy Hellman Group 1 SH A1. Ciphers AES 128 CTR. AES one on two dash CTR AES two five six dash CTR AES one two eight dash CBC that looks like and pub key accepted key types plus SSH RSA. Right, if I've typed that in correct, uh, incorrectly, pub key accepted key types plus SSH dash RSA. Yeah, so if I've typed that all correctly, hopefully I should now be able to try coming back in. Right. Um, dot SSH. So it says bad owner or permissions on that file. That could be that it's too permissive. That um, it could be that the read setting has been set for everybody. So I'm going to turn that off. Um, so that'll be O minus R dot SSH config. So if I now list that, you can see it's only readable and writable by anybody called Kernatex, i.e. the user I'm in at the moment, and anybody in the group Kernatex, i.e. me at the well, Kernatex, because that's, as far as I know, the only user that's part of that group but there could be other users part of that group so let's try that again okay so maybe it doesn't like the group part of it as well then so let's try changing that group minus read write so it's only 
uh, readable and writable by the owner, which is Kerner Text. There's only one person. Right, it still didn't work. I wonder why that is. Right, let's edit that again. I've had this working, so I don't know why it's not working now. Um, oh, I well, know. Let's try root at p two three three because for a start there isn't any kernel text user. No, I don't think that makes any difference. Um, let's just double check this again. Host one nine two. Um, Let's come back and just check. Let's restart it. Oh, I'm stumped by this. Oh, right, okay, that's strange. So, accessing it with the IP address works, but not with the DNS translation. So, there must be some, maybe the DNS server's inserting something, I don't know. Not quite sure what's happening there, but yes, it's uh, working with the IP address, so that's good enough. So, if I type in yes... So the password of the local machine, and there we are, I'm back on the um, machine that I've just built LFS5 on. So I've, I've created an SSH connection from the P233 into the Pentium Pro 200, and then I've created another connection back again, back into this original machine. So it shows that the SSH is working both directions. It also means on the next build that I'll do, which is LFS 6.3, that I'll be able to um, connect. Instead of using Telnet, I'll be using um, SSH now that I've got that config file there. In fact, I'll try deleting that, see if that makes a difference or he's renaming it. Oh, right, so it is making a difference then. Oh, is it taking that IP address literally? That's probably what it's doing, isn't it? Okay. So if I put config.backup back to config and then edit that again. Oh, what have I done there? See. Yeah, let's see if I can put in another host there, P233. See if that works. No, that doesn't work. Let's try putting in host. P233. Uh, yes, yeah, so that works. So that's the reason why it looks specifically the name that I'm using. Yeah, I'm in. Okay, and let's just try the IP address again, see if I've got that format correctly, or if I've got to create one connection line. Yes, I do have to create one connection line. So I need to recreate this for every single way of connecting. So P233 
and also for example if I wanted to do host p233 dot uh, mynet dot org put that in there and I'll put that in there as well oops So now I should be able to connect using any one of these methods. Yep. Yep. And dot mynet dot org. Yep, that's works as well. And that's all done. So I think that is a complete build. And as I said at the beginning of the Linux and Scratch 5, I've always considered Linux and Scratch 5 to be quite a durable build, quite a robust build. And I think that's indicated by the fact that I didn't have to search for any fixes or any hacks or workarounds to get this built. It just built as it was, this instruction straight out of the book. I went, all right, I've renamed the kernel name, but that's not exactly affecting how the system's compiled. And that also, remember, is including the fact that if you've watched my Linux and Scratch 4 video, some of the packages there aren't exactly the same version as were originally used with Linux and Scratch 4. Um, and I seem to remember I had to do a few tweaks and adjustments there to get that to work. So it, it is quite a, as I say, good, good robust build. Uh, the instructions, it's more akin to the modern ones. I seem to remember a little bit later on, some of the versions were a little bit difficult to build sometimes. Um, but the recent ones, certainly since I've been building them again regularly since about version 8 or so, um, they've been probably just as durable. You can take virtually any any Linux system and that's within the constraints, the host system requirements, and guarantee that you'll have a successful build, assuming you don't make any mistakes. And I'm wondering how much it is down to the host system requirements that are in the book now that you know you've got a um, a standard to start from, whereas previously it was, you know, just go and get a Linux system and start building from that, but you don't know if that Linux system's, um, you know, if the tools are up to date, if the tool chain's up to date, if it's even capable of building in the right way, um, which, as you'll see with 6.3, is uh, quite an important uh, predicate for building success successfully. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, please like the videos you've watched if you have found them useful. And subscribe to my channel if you want to get to hear more about the stuff that I do. Goodbye.